Hey, Crystal. Well, where's everybody at? Can you hear me? Oh, Crystal, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, did you say something? Can you hear me? Yeah, my volume oh. was down. Sorry. Oh my, oh my gosh, I lose my mind here. Where's everybody else at? Are you not eating any broccoli today? No, I ate already. Oh, this time change is weird, huh? Yeah, it, it gets so dark too soon. Did you vote? I did like two hours ago. Good, good for you. Good for you. Um, I'm gonna give those guys a couple more seconds. How how is the how is the module? Overwhelming? No, it's good. It should lighten up. Um, I mean, the turbocharger thing this week is it, it is a, there's a lot involved with all that stuff, but oh, after. Man. This, after this week, after this week, it should lighten up quite a bit. Um, and, you know, and, and you, so you'll have time to kind of catch up on some of that reading and stuff. Um, and the tests are pretty simple. I think I'm trying to, I, I'm, I'm trying to get it so that, you know, I'm not trying to bog you down on any tests or anything. And I, I just want you to, if you're paying attention to the lectures and, and getting some of this, you know, there's, there's so much to learn that, that if you're getting some of it, you're okay. Yeah. yeah. And the readings, um, the readings are pretty good. Um, I, I don't have a lot of pictures in the readings and I'm trying to throw those in there, trying to add those to that. Um, How can I find your animations? Um, the ones that I showed you? Yeah. Um, let me put those, I, let me, I'm gonna, I'll put those up as, they're actually in the, I put the PowerPoints in you can go through and see them in the PowerPoints. They are in there, but I will, uh, either when we're done here or tomorrow morning, I will put those, all the animations that I have for the specific areas. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll build a, um, uh, uh, module that's just, you know, or, um, you know, a, a section of the module that'll just have those animations. Unfortunately, you won't be able to interact with them with the animations because, oh, no. because I was able, all I did, was able to do with those is take them, uh, I can I can put them on my screen, and all I'm doing is is taking a movie of oh, okay. that screen, and, and I'm working the animation for you, and then putting it up on there. But I I can't I I have tried every way from Sunday to try to grab that animation out of that book, and try to get it on there, and they have protected that thing to death. But I figured out how to record it in a PowerPoint, and then I can take those recordings out, and I can take that video out. Um, so you can see them. Those are good though, aren't they? They really yeah. are helpful. Yeah, I like them. And today's, today's stuff is, is, you know, overwhelmingly simple, but complicated at the same time. And, and, and trying to get your head wrapped around it without those animations would be pretty tough, but I got some, I got some good animations for today. So, um, well, I don't know if anybody else is going to show up, so I'm just going to get started so that we're not here all night. And if, they just have to catch up if they don't. So I'm going to start. I've got a uh, PowerPoint here. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the common rail fuel systems. So just like just like the um, QE fuel system, what the the problems that they faced was the fact that old diesel engines, their mechanical systems were were uh, limited by 
how much pressure they could make at low ends. So in other words, they were in order to make in order to make pressure, the engine RPM had to be high. So at low RPMs, they couldn't make really good pressure. And so they they didn't they polluted a lot and they they just didn't have a lot of control of them. And that com or that Huey system was an answer originally to be able to solve that problem. Um, but it too had its limitations. But this common rail system is like by far the coolest fuel system and simple, super simple in its in its you know construction and everything. Yet its its abilities are really crazy. So um, the, the purpose of it and the and the whole fundamentals of it is to supply fuel at injection pressure. In other words, at those really high pressures at any speed. Okay, and that's what we're looking for. And that's what the Huey system was able to do was to deliver high pressures at any speed. And that's what we're going to do with this. We can we can put, you know, we can make at idle per near almost 30,000 PSI of fuel pressure and be able to inject that into the cylinder. So um, that's uh, that's kind of the key to this whole thing. Uh, the injector pumps are all, the high pressure pumps are always driven from the engine, usually gear driven. I think there's one that's chain driven on our 3.2. And I'm going to pretty much stick to our 6.4, our 3.2, our 6.7. And um, to a lesser extent, our three liter uses it. But um, I'll be honest with you, we have so little problems with it. I have very little and very little experience with it as other than the fact that it's its system is very much like the 6.7. So it's, um, but the, the 6.4, the 3.2 and the 6.7 are three kind of different systems, but they're all three common rail systems. Are you taking notes? Should I? Well, I mean, are you, are you, do you, I don't know if you do or not. Sometimes I do, yeah. Um, do you have a pencil and paper right now? Yeah. Okay, write, write these things down. We're going to, um, we're going to talk about the high pressure pump, pressure control valves, volume control valves, piezoelectric injectors, a couple of different ones, and then hydraulically balanced nozzles. Okay. As I give you those, if we talk about them, I need you to check them off. I don't want to, if, if I skip something or miss something, I want you to, these, those are the things that you need to understand. There's, there's so much to understand about this that it'd be, I could bog you down for the next week, just yapping at you. But I want you to just have a clue as to how these things operate and what's going on with them. But before I get started, I'm gonna turn a fan on because it's like 900 degrees in here. Hang on a second. Okay, so um, this is just a picture of a basic, it's generic, it doesn't, it isn't, uh, I'll, I'll, we don't use all the pieces that are on this, but this is pretty generic. You're going to have some sort of a low pressure system, whether it pumps in the tank or on the rail. I mean, we talked about horizontal fuel conditioning modules, all that kind of stuff. It's just going to be some sort of a low pressure system that's going to deliver fuel to a high pressure pump. The high pressure pumps are going to come in two different ways. The, um, the 6.4 and the 3.2 have a transfer pump mounted in the high pressure pump. In other words, we're going to deliver probably somewhere between three and eight PSI, really low pressure supplied, low pressure to this pump. And then it's going to have a mechanical pump in the back of it that's going to uh, bump up its pressure to somewhere between 40 and 60 PSI. The 6.7 and the, and the three liter uh, all have a uh, we, we deliver 60 PSI roughly through a pump to the pump, to the high pressure pump, and the pump has no transfer pump inside itself. So, um, and, I'll, and I'll show you an animation of that here in a minute. But this pump then, it pumps pressure from anywhere from roughly four to 5,000 pounds up to as much as 30,000 PSI. And it goes out through hard steel lines to what we call the common rail. And that's where it gets its name is this rail is a just a big tube generally that's it's kind of acts like a reservoir, but it holds all that pressure. OK, so it's common to all the cylinders. It just goes out there and that pressure is just available at the injectors. OK, 
And then we, cause that fuel is available at the injector, we're going to just turn on and off that injector and, and uh, run the cylinders. Okay. That's, that's a description of how this system operates in its simplest form. How it does it though is a lot more complicated and kind of interesting and all it's going to be computer controlled and, and all, all of that. So um, the system is so much more precise than the Huey system that it's, that it's not even in comparison. The, you know, the old, if we went back to old injector pumps and stuff like that, they metered fuel pretty, pretty accurately for what they were. And then we went to the uh, Huey one or the A and B Hueys and those things, those things, you know, they metered fuel what they did, but then we went to that uh, digital one with the two solenoids on it. And that thing, you know, that we could, we could do pilot injection and, you know, multiple events and, and, but it was still pretty sloppy because they were using magnets to, you know, magnetic fields to try to move that, uh, that uh, metering valve or the spool valve. But in, but in these, we can, we can super precisely, and I think I've got it in here, we can precisely uh, uh, inject fuel in, up to what it says here, up to nine events. And I think, I think that there's one injector that actually does 10 events. Okay. When we say 10 events, that's firing 10 times within a millisecond. Okay. A millisecond is 0 0.001 of a second. Okay. And those events of those 10 events, they take as much as 500 milli microseconds, which is 0 0.0005. That's how fast those events take place, and we can and and they're doing it super accurately with this uh, with these piezoelectric injectors. So um, the advantages of this thing is that we can control fuel timing, we can control rates, we can do everything super super precise, which is gonna which is going to um, and here's a here's kind of a picture you know i think we've seen these kind of pictures before where you know they're going to fire the injector they can fire the injector then have a main injection then we can do them afterwards and these are just a kind of a a if you were to watch watch the events take place on a on a graph um but by doing this we can we can improve fuel economy reduce emissions um get better power and just overall better driving vehicle okay uh, because of our ability to control all this stuff, we can control our injection timing to within one hundredth of a degree of a crankshaft rotation. Okay, that means there's 36 degrees in a crankshaft rotation, right? If you took that one degree and divided it into a hundred pieces, we can be accurate into one one hundredth of that piece of degree. So I mean, we are super precise on these on these things. Okay. Now, we talked about fuel pressurization at any speed. <clears throat> if you took an old, you know, an old system that it, whoop, back that up. If you took, um, it would take RPM, RPMs this and pressures here, you'd have to raise the RPM in order to be able to get pressure out of it. Well, with this, with these high pressure pumps and the regulation that we're able to do with it, we can get pressure almost immediately at low RPM. So we can, so we can have, remember we have to, we need those high pressures in order to penetrate that dense air mass, especially if we're turbocharging the engine and we've got lots of boost pressure in there. And we, cause we want to get that fuel in, we want to get it to, to, uh, um, yeah, what do we want it to, what do we want it to do? We want it to absorb heat so that it can vaporize so that we can get it to uh, a burn and, you know, get out into the cylinder and, and burn and, and make our power. Okay. So, okay. So here's just a, um, uh, you know, we can with this, with these injectors and I'm going to show you, you just got to bear with me. I'm going to get a little ahead of myself, but I'm going to explain how this is going to happen, but I'm just kind of saying, this is what we're going to do. And I'm going to show you how we're going to do it, but we can control our injection super precise. Where in the old days, they were just kind of sloppy and it had to be that way every time where with, with the way we can control this injection, we can control it super precise. Make We can make square patterns. We can make curved patterns um, uh, depending on how 
and we'll get into rate how how that does in a little bit. So anyway, we can get better fuel economy, less emissions, improve combustion quality, and and increase power. Okay. So here is the first animation that I have for you. This is kind of a crude animation. It's very generic. A uh, lot of the pieces on here Ford doesn't even use, but it's but it's pretty good in the fact that it it kind of explains what's going on. The high pressure pump and, we'll, and it'll will blow up here in a minute. Um, these these things here would be considered your pistons and this is your um okay this is your low pressure fuel is going to come in uh here and fill up and then as it as this little i mean they look just like this they're just really small they're about the size of a pencil and as it pressurizes fuel it's going to go out past the check ball there and that's going to um um pressurize the high pressure rail, okay? And we'll talk about the control valves and all that, but this is just important to see that, that all that, this is all the high pressure pumps do, is pump fuel through a piston and they suck it in, they push it out. It's, it's super simple as far as that's concerned. Um, okay. This is the injector. I'm gonna, I, in fact, I probably should have even not even showed this, but this is how the injectors work. And, and, and I'll, I will, we got better animations than this. Let's see if I can get past this. Okay, let me, let me just pop, stop that. So as this, as the high pressure system pressures, uh, as it pressurizes fuel, pushes it out into the common rail, okay? Then the common rail is fuel is available to the injector and then the injector puts it in the cylinder. It is by far the most simple system that's out there. I mean, it doesn't, it's not overly complicated by any stretch of the imagination. So um, I hope this animation, it doesn't, because it's really busy. Uh, does it does it make sense what's happening there? Yeah, the pump the pumps pumping the pressure, the pressure is available to the injector, and then the injector is putting it in the cylinder. Okay, so we're going to shift gears here. We're going to talk about the injectors, and they're got they're called servo hydraulic control, and we're going to talk about um, kind of we're going to talk generically about the injectors, we're going to talk generically about uh, hydraulically balanced nozzles. And then from there, we're going to go and kind of get specific into a couple of forward injectors that we use. Okay. <clears throat> but we're going to use um, hydraulic forces to open and close our nozzle. Okay. And so it gives us the ability to, um, work way faster than them relying on, you know, the old, like the, the Hueys that had magnets, you know, uh, solenoids that they magnetized and then open and close and stuff like that. Because we're going to use hydraulic forces, they're, they can be controlled super, super fast. And so um, that gives us the ability to put that highly pressurized fuel in the cylinder quickly and more precisely without any kind of you know, drooling or, or, or anything. Um, so we're going to use hydraulically balanced nozzles, which I'm going to show you in a minute. So we're just some of the characteristics of it. We're going to have a smaller spring, weaker, uh, weaker no, uh, nozzle spring. And I'll show you that where they are in a second here. Um, so we're going to use highly pressurized fuel, which is the, the fuel we're using pressures we're using are way higher than the Hueys. You know, I think the Hueys were 21,000 PSI. And we're using 26 and 30,000 PSI, depending on, you know, what's going on. Um, so this will make sense in a minute, but the pressure differential between the area above the nozzle and below the nozzle is what keeps it closed. Okay. And that's what's going to cause this thing a, to be hydraulically balanced. And the pressure change of the hydraulic pressure tipping point classifies the CR nozzles as hydraulically balanced. That doesn't make any sense to you. Does it make any sense to you yet? Give me a what's, sec. No, what's CR? Common rail. Oh, okay. Common rail. Yeah. Okay. 
this is just all we're just talking. Okay, so here's some pictures of the different kinds of injectors that are out there. I think this is one out of a six, seven. Um, yeah, they, they, yeah, it's, it's the only one of them that's a Ford. But so, so, oh, I thought I put this picture on a different slide. Um, poo. Let me do this. Let me do something here. Since it's just you and me, bear with me for one second. I want to go here. I want to steal. Oh, I don't think I can. Oh, it's not going to let me. It's not going to let me because we're in here. So we're going to go kind of go back and forth. We're going to go back and forth um, in here. So hydraulically balanced nozzle. So I drew a picture of a, a, a standard nozzle that you would find in any inject, in, injection system since the 20s. And what it is, all's an, all's an injector nozzle does, is the same as like what's in a Huey, is you have a spring. How'd you like my drawing of my spring? Um, the spring sits above this pintle in here, right? The nozzle valve, needle valve. And we inject high pressure fuel in here. And that fuel lifts this against this spring pressure and the fuel is injected, okay? As the pressure goes down on this high pressure side, the spring closes it, okay? That's how a standard nozzle works. Pressure working against the spring. As soon as the as soon as this as soon as the pressure builds up high enough to overcome that spring pressure, it sprays fuel um, down here. Um, I can actually think I can draw you some better picture in here. So as soon as as soon as the high pressure fuel comes in here, it works against this right here, pushes this up, and then once that once this comes off here, fuel is going to spray. As the pressure comes, uh, starts to diminish here, the spring just pushes that back down again, and the fuel stops. That's how a standard nozzle used to work. Okay, stop that. Now, this is a what we call a hydraulically balanced nozzle. The spring that sits in here is very weak. We, when this injector's off, when the injector's closed, see all the dark purple here? All the dark purple is high pressure fuel. So if we had, um, if we had uh, say, you know, we'll just say, 20,000 PSI coming in here, okay? All this, all of this is under pressure, okay? So we have a, an area here that up here is going to be larger than the area here. Plus you have this spring pressure right in here, right? It's a, it's a light, it's just a small spring. It's not very big at all. But because we have pressure above and below, and we have the spring, this, this nozzle is forced against the seat here. So it doesn't flow any fuel, right? Even though we've got, we've got 30,000 pounds or 20,000 pounds of fuel available here, and it's pushing, it's trying to push up against this, but this pressure up here is pushing down on it. So what we're gonna do to open this thing and we'll talk about how we how we move this valve in a minute, but we're going to open this valve, and it's going to offset this this little area here is going to open, and it's going to dump this pressure that's all caught up in here. It's all going to rush out and go out the return fuel, and now there's less pressure above than below, and the and it's going to cause this needle valve to come off its seat and inject the fuel. All we have to do to stop that is turn this off. It shuts this off. And once that's shut off, uh, give me an eraser. Come on, where's my eraser? Okay. You'll notice, 
you'll notice a little guy right here. See that little, see that little orifice thing that's sitting there? Can you see that? Okay. That is connected. The fuel is actually coming into, it's coming into the injector right there or into the top of the injector right there. But it is an orifice in there that is small enough to where when this opens up and dumps, fuel can't get in there fast enough to replace it until it's closed. So it's always got fuel coming in against it. But as soon as we drop that mushroom valve right there, boom, that pressure builds back up and it shuts the injector right off. So it's what they call a hydraulically balanced nozzle. Pressure above, pressure below it keeps it closed. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's a simple part of this because now we're going to, now how they make that work is, is uh, a lot more fun here too. Um, well, I guess I better... I better go in and erase those. Uh... So this picture here is uh, uh, just the same the same idea, only just a couple of different ways they do it, um, uh, in which it doesn't really matter to us because I'm going to show you how we do it in the in the Ford injectors. So, so this is a. Um, this would be like an injector out of a 6.7. And, uh, and this is, this is the piezoelectric stack that we're going to talk about, but I think I've got, um, we're going to, yeah, let's talk about some other stuff first. But so, so again, I keep showing these, um, these slides, but it just gives us the ability to on off, on off, on off this thing a whole bunch of times. I mean, th all this is taking place within, within, you know, maybe two or three degrees of crankshaft rotation, super fast. Um, there's just a picture of that spring, a real live picture of that return spring on the nozzle. It's a lot smaller and lighter than it used to be. Um, so I don't want to drag a bunch of time into this here, but uh, rate shaping and, and injection rates, when we talk about rates, we're talking about the rate of fuel going into the cylinder. Okay. How not only how much we're putting in the fuel in the, in the cylinder, but how it's being injected. Is it, is it, or, you know, are we doing a pilot injection really fast and then, and then a long uh, main injection? Is it ramped? Is it, is it a triangle shape? All the different, all these different angles in which they can, um, you know, degrees of which it, it injects can affect how it's, um, uh, you know, making emissions how much make making power and everything like that. So we can, we can change, we can ramp it. We can do a lot of all these different things with how they can control that injector. Um, so yeah, so these are good to, these are, let me, let me move this, uh, let me move us a little bit here. I can't see us. Um, so injection rate, when plotted against the crankshaft rotation, um, it reveals the injection discharge curve. That's what that picture showed, okay? Optimal injection rate shapes depend on the speed and load under which the engine operates. Shorter injection duration with fewer injection events produce a faster rise in cylinder pressures, okay? They make faster rise in cylinder pressures which isn't a problem because we're doing it over a longer period of time and not doing it all at once. Remember when we, when they just, you know, dump a bunch of fuel in there and we get that big fuel crack, you know, we're, we're not, we don't have a mission. We're, you know, we're, we're polluting. We're, you know, it's not, it, we're not getting the ultimate, what we can get out of that fuel um, shot of fuel. The longer, harder uh, push uses more fuel efficiency to convert fuel into mechanical energy. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, if we have greater number of injection events, instead of having one gigantic event, um, we don't have that super big rise in pressure and temperature, which causes the formation of NOx, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. But NOx is that is nitrogen that's been oxidized under because it happens under high pressures and temperatures. But if we can have that cylinder fire um, 
under several smaller events and 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 have less pressure but a good but good power then we've got the ability to lower emissions okay and here's a really goofy hard to get your head around um, graph but just the different kinds of injection events um, that, that will take place you know for noise control uh, noise control and reduced particulate matter um, and, and NOx control, you know, just the different, they, they have figured out that, that different uh, rate shaping, they can control emissions throughout the range of torque that we're building this engine. Okay. Or we can just make one that's just pure power over here and it pollutes a lot, but there's, but we have the ability to, to rate shape in such a way that we can control emissions that we don't have to try to treat it afterwards. And so, and it all, and it all is because we can precisely fire those injectors. Um, yeah, here's an interesting ramped, ramped rate injects small amounts of fuel near top dead center. Square injection rates inject fuel quickly at high volumes near top dead center. And then a triangle rate uh, provides the best fuel economy during low torque demand. And so you've got, you know, they, they can make, they can do all these things to, you know, all within a split second and, and watch that fuel and, and watch that cylinder fire at better, you know, under better circumstances to make it more efficient and cleaner burning. Now, let's not kid ourselves. They could, they could just turn these things on and, and make some really good power out of this engine. But what happens is you don't get fuel economy, you have high emissions, and you can make a lot of power. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to get that balance between good fuel economy, good power and performance, and low emissions. Um... So this is, this is not important. It's only important to the next slide. Optimal injection rate shape is determined by using model predictive control. In other words, the, 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 the computer has all these algorithms inside itself to know exactly how to fire its injectors and, and how to do all these things. So where that really comes down to play is what they call fault healing, okay? Engine operating strategy that compensates for emission related faults. If the engine sees, if the OBD2 system starts seeing it's got faults, it's gonna go into uh, these um, different modes that it's gonna uh, kind of abandon all of its uh, algorithms that it had for all these predictive um, times and, and, and events. And it's gonna just kind of go in to try to cure an, an emissions event. So it, it thinks it's got, you know, it thinks it's polluting in some way. It's going to, it's going to completely abandon all the programs and it's going to go into a fault mode and it's going to try to overcome its, its perceived fault mode. And it's probably going to turn a check engine light on and it's going to, you're going to lose all the, um, you're going to lose all the fuel economy and power and everything because of what it's trying to do is, is keep the emission levels low, ultimately. Um, and those are what you're, we, we would call those uh, failure mode effects management modes. And they're gonna be D rates. You can drive down the road, all of a sudden it'll turn a wrench light on, turn a check engine light on, it'll say reduce power. It's gonna just gonna go into those, into these uh, programs that are just gonna to, to help it reduce um, um, soot, help it reduce um, uh, emissions and everything like that. So you, that's not, you, you don't need to remember all that. I just wanted to let you know that. Okay. Um, so we've got um, the construction of high pressure systems. The, you're going to have the, um, obviously we had the pump. Now we've got the tubes in the rails. The rails are, I mean, the, the common rails on these things are, they're like a rifle barrel. They're really, really heavy steel barrels because they got to hold a lot of pressure. And so they're, they're usually a, like a big, big, big pipe 
and then they're going to have it, they're going to be machined on the inside. And usually you're going to have, uh, you know, they're, they're probably cast and then they have um, fittings drilled in them for, to have all the, they go to all the different rails. Um, we're going to have a steel, the steel lines that are going to connect the, the uh, injectors to the common rail. We're going to have fuel injectors. We're going to talk about those in a second. And then there's going to be uh, some kind of transfer pressure, uh, transfer, transfer pumps, and you're going to have your um, microprocessors and all that stuff. And these are all the inputs that, that are going to affect it. They're going to be no really no different than uh, uh, Huey systems. You're going to have an accelerator position, accelerator pedal position, engine coolant temperature, uh, some sort of a high fuel pressure. You know, we call them FRP, fuel rail pressure sensors, uh, fuel temperature sensors, uh, EGR valve sensors, mass airflow. Uh, intake air temperatures, exhaust pressure, EGR temperatures, inlet and outlets, engine oil temperatures, MAP sensors, which is manifold pressure, crankshaft sensors, camshaft sensors. And uh, so, um, um, so you're just going to have all those things and we'll kind of, we'll, we'll get into all the computer control stuff in a couple of weeks. Um, so we're going to electronically regulate all the pressures that are taking place in this thing. And I really want to get to this redundant. Um, we've seen that picture earlier. Okay. I want to get to, we've talked about all this stuff. Okay. So, Piezo electric or piezo, piezo ceramic electric actuators. This is the this is the key to these common rails systems. Piezo ceramic wafers um, form an actuator mechanism. Piezo ceramic actuator consists of a long stack of overlapping wafers of uh, manufactured mineral crystals. Piezo ceramic uh, uh, minerals, I'm sorry, materials. They use them in speakers and stuff, and they can move us. Uh, it's you know, it frequencies at twenty thousand hertz. That's twenty thousand hertz would be twenty thousand times a second. Now, so this is a stack of piezoelectric crystals made in here, and they're they're manufactured. I think I have a picture of them here. What they are is it's just like a crystal. Um, so, so you know when you have a striker for um, like a, like your barbecue striker or like the little you know lighters that you um, not a big lighter where you where your thumb but the one you pull the trigger on and it snaps and it lights. Yeah. Okay. So what they're doing is they're smacking a crystal, not you, but a a piezoelectric crystal, some sort of a crystal. Crystals have a charge. You, if you, if you crush, if you, if you were to um, put them under pressure, you can, you can, you can get it. You can actually measure an electric charge of them. Okay. Conversely, if we put a charge on them, they react. Okay. So here's, here's a, uh, a um, uh, electronically neutral crystal we're going to put a positive and negative on it and it causes it to shrink and get long this is a, a way over exaggeration if we, re, we if we reverse the polarity on it it's going to get skinny and tall okay so when we have these crystals all stacked up inside here we can put a positive charge on them and we can make them grow. We can reverse that charge and we can make them shrink. So we can, and we can make these happen super, super fast. So one of the things, and I don't know if it says it here on the slides, but these things, if they, I think it's in your readings, if you were to read it, but they're nothing but but manufactured crystals are just little wafers that are in there and they're all stacked up against each other. And so they're, they're, they're going to move like, like 40 microns, not very big at all. 
So they stack a whole bunch of them together. And then they, as they uh, grow, they're going to, you know, it makes them grow further. Um, but they're also going to do something else with them because they, over time, they're rubbing against each other constantly as they grow and shrink and grow and shrink and they wear out or they kind of grind against each other. So they'll actually put a lot more in there than they really need to give it more longevity. But what, uh, so what, what happens here is as we change the size of this crystal stack in here, it's going to move, it, it's going to grow and this particular one is going to push down against this little mushroom valve in here, or it's going to lift it up. One of, whoops, sorry, one or the other. So, so you have that. Uh, that's how we're. Remember, I said. Remember, in that hydraulically balanced injector, we are opening and closing that valve. That's how we're doing it. And what happens here is we can, the response time on this piezoelectric crystal is like super fast compared to an electromagnetic actuator like you'd have in a Huey system. So we can much more precise because of that. Um, so we can avoid the problem of injection lag, uh, can respond rapidly to current flow, uh, natural, you know, it, it works against both both polarities. Um, and yeah, sending it one, sending the DC current one direction, and then reversing it, we can we can super fast uh, change its its size. Um, so because of that, because if we have the ability to change current back and forth super fast, that's how we're able to make those events um, happen. So we can in one event we can have the current go one direction and then we can turn it the other direction so we can turn on turn off okay because because you could um and i think the semen system all it does is power it up and then let it go where it becomes more precise if we if we turn it on and then turn it off if we, if we just reverse polarity and that's a picture of what you're seeing here is they're reversing polarity and making it making that those crystals um work much more, much more faster. Is that probably not good English, but that's okay. I'm an auto teacher, not a English teacher. Okay. So um, here's just a picture of that, but I think I have a, uh, I have a, an animation coming up. Okay. So, so let's go to the animation and then we'll back up it, because if we go to the animation, then this will make more sense. I probably should have put it earlier. Okay. So here's an animation. So you can see on the left here, you can see the crystal stack. You know, this is exaggerated, obviously, but you can see it growing, or, you know, getting smaller and bigger. So And I think I'm going to see if you can watch this. See this purple part in here. As this, as we make that grow, it opens this valve right there, and it dumps the fuel. And as it closes, it builds the fuel. Once it dumps it, okay. Now it dumps it, then it injects the fuel. And then as it closes the valve and the fuel rushes back in, it shuts. That's how, and, and, and keep in mind that this, they're making that look like that's moving, you know, a lot. It's really not. It's moving, it's moving like, like, you know, less than a thousandth of an inch. I mean, it's really small. Does that make sense? You want to see that animation again? Sure. Okay. So 
So when I slow it down, it was really. See in this inlet restrictor, <clears throat> this is where that fuel's coming in right here. And that restrictor is what causes the pressure differential in there when, he, when it dumps and it opens right there and it dumps that pressure. Fuel is still trying to get in there, but it can't because of the control valve here is bigger. This, this, this valve here is bigger than this restrictor. And so the pressure just runs right on out. So what causes the stack crystals to extend? Electricity. Oh, okay. We're sending a we're sending we're sending a a DC current. I, you know, and I don't know. I know that some of them are using a high voltage. Um, I don't honestly know. I don't think that Fords are high. I think Fords are just a regular standard 12 volts. Uh, but I, I, you know what? I have to find that out. I've never had to. I've never had to um, to deal with that. I do know that. I do know that I think one of the slides we're going to have in here is is similar to what is in the 3.2 uh, engine. And they're telling you to use big rubber gloves and everything when you're working on it. And Ford has never told us we had to do that on these things. Uh, so I would assume I would assume we're just using a 12 volt DC. But I but I could be wrong. <clears throat> but also doing they have an electric, you know, there's an electrical connector here. And also <clears throat> the computers just just, you know, sending a voltage out and then reversing that polarity, you know, just back and forth uh, multiple times in a second to make that happen. And and so fuel is just going to, we're going to have on top of here, this is going to be attached to the common rail. Okay. So this is always going to have that high pressure fuel in it. So this thing's always under pressure. And when the injector is off, you're going to have pressure above it and below it. But all we're doing, only thing we're doing is using hydraulic pressure. We're just going to open that up, dump it. And we're just letting the hydraulics do all the work. Instead of instead of like a Huey did, um, trying to use an electric magnet to try to do it. Now, there were some early um, Bosch systems that used magnets um, on the common rail, <clears throat> but they weren't very efficient, and they knew that these um, piezo crystals were were the answer to do them way quick, make way quicker. So we're using uh, piezoelectric stacks on on all our common rail systems. We had introduced them in the 6.4, which we're gonna, we'll see some slides on that. And then, but the, the 3.2, the three liter and the 6.7 all use uh, a bit. And it looks, they look just like this big, long, long injectors with a stack of crystals. I've never actually taken them apart. I've never seen one in real life, um, but. Um, okay, so this is the Siemens system that's in the, um, well, let's go back first. I promised, I told you I would do that. So, so before the injection happens, fuel pressure develops in the high pressure pump builds uh, and it builds pressure in the pressure chamber and above the uh, control rod. So it's, remember it was above and below the, the rod. So everything's, everything's charged full of fuel, ready to go, okay? <clears throat> the force against the top of the rod firmly seats the nozzle and the valve because remember it's got a the the valve in this one here has there's more surface area because right here it's only pushing up right here so the surface area up here is larger than the surface area down here plus there's a spring um, there's a spring helping it here too but hydraulically this thing is wanting to, when, when you got pressure on both sides, there's more pressure pushing down than trying to push up. So when this thing's just sitting there idle, nothing's happening, that thing's pushed down and, and seated. Um, so the beginning of injection, the PCM sends out electricity to, um, to those uh, stack of um, crystals. And then 
of course it says here magnetic force, but those crystals move that uh, port or that, that drain orifice and it allows fuel, that high pressure fuel above the injector, above the nozzle to vent off. Okay, the pressure up, pressure above the control rod drops, pressure below the nozzle forces the nozzle up off its seat and injection begins. A uh, fully lifted nozzle sprays fuel into the combustion chamber at a pressure equal to fuel rail, okay? So one of the things that was always a limitation for even let's just say the, um, the, the Huey injector, remember in the Huey injector, when it injected fuel, it was pushing the oil pressure was working against that intensifier piston to push a shot of fuel in. So you only had one full stroke of fuel and that was it, okay? It didn't get to, um, it didn't get to recharge itself. It had one shot. This thing here, as long as we hold that injector open, it's going to spray that fuel because remember that we've got all the pressure we need. We're not trying to make it at the injector. We're making that that pressure's already in the rail. So if that injector stays open, it can just spray fuel an unlimited amount of fuel into that cylinder. Okay, not that we would ever do that, but we have the ability to do that. But what happens if that thing stays, if something happens in that, in that valve leaks, and now all of a sudden you've got high pressure fuel squirting into that cylinder all the time. Ain't good. It melts in, it'll just melt an engine. So, um, so the pressure drop uh, is controlled by the difference between the diameters of the inlet and the outlet orifices. Uh, drain orifice will always be larger than the inlet orifice and open and close the nozzle valve. Speed of the nozzle valve lifts, lift is determined by the difference of flow rates. In other words, how, how, how uh, much they're going to have that thing on. Uh, the nozzle differential ratio control nozzle lifting and closing pressures ensures that the nozzle opens, opening pressure is always higher than the closing pressure. Um, okay, and then when it's all done, we're gonna close that. We're gonna turn the inject the crystals off. We're gonna close that uh, drain valve and then the pressure is gonna build on the top against that top of the, uh, of the um, needle seat there and it's gonna seat it. So it's just, I mean, that's pretty simple. It's gonna be, oh gosh darn, I keep doing that. Right there, if it's filling, let's see, let's wait, let's get there. Let's, come on, baby. No, oh, I guess it turned off. So when it's, okay, when it's off, it's filling, and then when it's on, it's spraying. Okay. Does that make sense? I don't want to labor, belabor it to death. Okay. So this is the semen injector. Um, it's for all intents and purposes, very much the same. However, some of the differences are going to be the other one, the return fuel escaped through a thing up in the top and had a return rail here. The Siemens has a return drain port in the side here, and it goes through a rail cross-drilled in the cylinder head. Um, this one, instead of, it uses a, the piezo stack is way up in the top up here, and it uses a big, long control rod in, inside the injector rather than having it all down at the bottom. But its concept is exactly the same. Um, fuel pressure is the same. It's going to come in in two different ports here, though. It's going to come down into here. It's going to be that um, high pressure fuel down here. It's going to work against this. However, we have the fuel pressure up here and the spring, the springs down here working against it. And it's going to keep it seated until we open this valve, vent this off. And then it's going to do the exact same thing as the other, just a little bit differently. Um, we don't need to belabor that, but you can see the valving on here. Here's your little orifice uh, to keep it from, uh, the, the, is your pressure differential. 
and it just has a uh, mushroom valve in right in here that just opens and closes and dumps that pressure. And I do have a cool animation for this. This is so there's the animation for this one. Does exactly the same thing, just does it a little bit differently. So if you remember right, I think the last one makes the crystals get smaller to open it up. And this one here makes them bigger to open it up. Make sense? Yes. But for all intents and purposes, they're doing, they're doing the same. They're all, they're all doing the same thing. They're just doing it maybe a little bit differently, but they're what they're, they're, how they're, all they're doing is, is, is messing with that balanced nozzle to be able to control that fuel super quick. Okay. So we've talked about the piezoelectric injectors. We talked about hydraulically balanced nozzles. We talked briefly about the high pressure pumps. Um, and then, so, so the other things that are really important about this system is how we're controlling the high pressure because high pressure is really important um, that, that we have it precisely measured. If we have the precision in the high pressure fuel, then we can inject it properly. So how they're gonna do that um, is Okay, so let's talk about pumps here first, I guess. I got ahead of myself. Uh, so the pumps are nothing more than, uh, I don't have a, there we go, this is a really good picture of a pump. These are just pumps, they have a gear drive in here and they just have, these are just, they have pistons inside here, just like it, we showed you on that animation. They're about the size of a pencil. They don't build a lot of volume because they don't need a lot of volume. We just want a lot of pressure. And they just, they're about the size of a pencil and they just work against a spring. And um, the 6.4 uses a three cylinder pump. The 3.2 uses a three cylinder pump. The six liter, I mean, the 6.7 and the three liter both use a two piston pump, very similar to this one here on the right. And um, they have a fuel volume control valve, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. And they just continually, continually pump fuel. That's all they do. Pump fuel. The regulators determine what the pressure is going to be, but as that engine is turning, those things are pumping fuel and, and they're, they're just going to pump all day long. So we're going to use valving to uh, control how this thing works. And we're going to talk about the three, two system first. The, have you taken the fuel course did you take the fuel course for the web base yet? Okay. Um, so the, the three, two and the six, four have normally closed volume control valves. They all have, and, and the three, two only has one valve. The six, four and the six, seven use uh, normally open pressure control valves. So when I, I have, say, what? I have, I have finished it. You did. Okay. So you remember that when I said that, that's what, that's one of the slides in there that tells you that. Yeah. Okay. So the volume control valve on the three, two is controls all the pressure and everything in that engine and how they're doing it is they're just, they're just changing how much fuel can go into the 
pump to make pressure. So as it tries to make pressure, it's it, if it tries if it's too high, it starts dumping the fuel the pressure out. If it goes down, it closes off and makes more pressure. So um, that's what it's uh, that's how the three two operates, um, and that's how it makes its pressure. It doesn't it. In other words, it doesn't uh, it doesn't dump any of its pressure back into the system like a um, pressure control valve, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, so how it does it. I think I even have an animation here. Yeah, I got another animation. So it's either gonna if we if we don't want any pressure, we're gonna we're gonna shut it off. If we want to open it up, we're gonna put pressure. Or I guess it's working backwards. What I'm talking about here, pressure is going to. Wait, a minute, this is is this thing backwards? Okay, it's normally closed. If we want it, we're gonna we're gonna turn it off, and we're gonna get more pressure to the pump. If we if we uh, if we shut it off, if we turn it on, we're going to shut the pressure off to the pump. So we can control the pressure um, by. turning on and off this volume control valve. You can see it when I move the valve up there, how much further it's on. If we turn it on, it's gonna shut it off. And all we're doing is controlling the volume of fuel going to the cylinder or into the pump. So how much pump, how much fuel it has available to pump. Okay. The big systems that we have in the 6.4 and in the 6.7 use two controllers. We're going to control volume going into the pump and we're going to control pressure coming out. So the reason we're going to control volume going in is because one of the problems that we have in the diesel engines, modern diesel engines, is that is that we all, diesel engines have always had a lot of fuel come to them and then they use what they need and then they send back to the, the rest of it back to the tank. Well, the stuff going back to the tank has a couple of problems. It, it's heated. Okay, because it went through, it, it got pumped, it got went through the engine, and it collected a whole bunch of heat. Hot fuel does a couple of things. Remember when we talked about uh, fuel systems and stuff, anything above 90 degrees, and it starts, uh, you start losing um, like 2% for every 10 degrees of, of power out of that fuel, available power out of that fuel, the higher the temperatures go. Okay, so once we start heating that fuel up, it's a problem. The other thing is once it's heated up, it starts vaporizing. We start getting fuel vapors. Okay, the, the, all that kind of stuff is a problem. And so we've got all that fuel. There's, there's no need to have all that fuel going back to the fuel tank. So what they're gonna do is we're gonna have a volume control valve. So when we don't need a whole bunch of fuel going through, they're gonna start um, either, the, depending on which it is, we're either gonna um, turn on or off that volume control valve. And we're gonna send that fuel we're gonna, we're gonna stop it from coming into the fuel tank or into the um, high pressure pump. And so, so it can't put out as much volume, okay? So, so then after the pumps, whatever, whatever volume comes into it, it starts pumping pressure. And that those, remember those pistons are just gonna make pressure in that common rail system, okay? They're going to then, there's a, actually this is a 6.7. And that's a, there's your common rails, one on each side. And for whatever reason, we're talking about uh, pressure regulators. The other regulators actually on the other side. Let me see if I have a good picture of a pressure regulator here. Uh, the pressure regulator is going to take that high pressure fuel. Okay, so now that high pressure fuel is coming into this regulator. And it's either going to, if it's, 100% closed, it's going to make 100% the pressure that's in there. If it's all the way open, if we don't do anything to it, it's not normally open. All the pressure is going to dump and run right back into the tank. Into the, it's going to go right to the return system and back to the fuel tank. So we're going to either open or close this valve. If we start to close this valve, it's going to start making more pressure. We, if we open the valve, it's going to dump it back to the tank. So it's just, all we're doing is just, is just regulating the pressure in that high, in, you know, in the common rail. And those common rails, if we had these picture here of this six, seven, there's one on this side of the engine and there's one on the other. And this fuel line right here 
connects the two together so that both systems, both sides of the engine have the same pressure all the time. And all we're going to do is, is if it got too much pressure, we're just going to dump it back to the, to the tank and we can do it super, super precisely so that we don't, um, so we can have, we can monitor and know what's happening with that high pressure system. The, let me go back to the beginning. Let me go with the two pressure system here. So the two regulators work together to regulate the fuel pressure and the flow. The inlet volume metering valve is typically normally closed, but some of them are normally open. The, the six seven is normally open. The second pressure regulating valve is normally open. That's what I was talking about. Uh, PCM regulates that fuel pressure. It uses a fuel pressure regulator and it uses a fuel rail pressure sensor and it just senses it and and just works back and forth. It's kind of a closed loop system to make sure that it monitors and regulates that fuel pressure. Uh, don't need to know about that. We just talked about that. So as this thing pumps, this is this is a three pump system here. This would be like something out of a 6.7. You have a, remember we talked about the six, I mean 6.4, the 6.4 has a transfer pump that supplies pressure into here. As this pump turns, these, these uh, as this, this turns in here, these pistons just push fuel out, make high pressure. The high pressure comes out, goes to the common rail. And then the, uh, Regulator just regulates and dump, it either dumps it back to the return or dumps it back into the inlet side of that. So I want to not belabor this. I want to just kind of look this through this, make sure there's nothing else. So I want to know from you. So we call it a common rail fuel system. It's called a common rail because all the injectors are attached to a common rail. The common rail gets its fuel pressure from a fuel pump. The fuel pump pressures are regulated by the computer by a pressure regulator and a pressure control valve. Okay, the volume control valve controls the amount of volume coming into the pre into the pump and, it, and it regulates how much fuel's available there so that we're not putting so much fuel out and having to put a bunch back to the tank. The pressure control valve just regulates pressure in that valve by dumping the excess pressure to the return line, all computer controlled, measured by a fuel rail pressure sensor in a closed loop system, the computer computer watches. It, it says, "I'm going to put. I'm going to make a decision to put my pressure control valve at 50% duty cycle, and I end up with, you know, 18,000 psi. I want it to go to. I want it to go to 20,000 psi. I'm going to move the regulator up. If it goes to 18,000 psi, if it goes to 19.5, it's going to move it up a little bit more. It's going to read it." make an adjustment, read it, make an adjustment. It's a closed loop system constantly in that circle. The piezoelectric crystal or injectors are hydraulically balanced injectors and they're just going to take and deliver that fuel into the cylinders at rates that are that no other system has been able to, to um, duplicate. So does all that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of minutia involved in these slides and in the readings about rates, rate, you know, fuel injection rates. I mean, when we talk about fuel injection rates, we're talking about the rate in which it's going in, how much is going in, the time it's going in. All of that stuff is, is stuff that, okay, we can know and it's a bunch of stuff that we can't do anything about. Also, it's just nice to know that all that kind of stuff has taken place, but it's just, my, my hope is that you have an understanding of how 
the common rail system works and how much different it is than a Huey system and how much different that is than a standard old high pressure system, okay? Almost, almost exclusively, I would say, I think Caterpillar is still using some Huey systems, but almost exclusively, everything is, is using common rail because it's because we can control it so precisely. You know, we didn't have this ability, you know, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, Siemens has been using it for what they said since 2001. I don't know what they originally had it on, but we introduced it in 2008 and it's, and it works, it works really good. So um, there's a lot of stuff. I, there's a lot of stuff in the, um, uh, slides. There's a lot of stuff in the readings. Um, and if you got the book, if you had the book, there's even a lot more because there's a, there's Delphi makes a system. There's a, there's a bunch of different kind of systems that are out there. So there's, there's, I'm, I'm only showing you what Ford's got out there. Um, all this stuff. And most of this is all driven by OBD2 legislation, in other words, all emissions related, uh, emissions and fuel economy, CAFE standards, and but mostly emission standards. And uh, we, will, we will delve into a lot of that uh, later on, uh, you know, kind of how the OBD2 system works, the monitors and all that. I mean, it's, it's one of the most aggravating parts of the diesel engine, trying to do all that. Um, This is just all. So we're going to get out of here early. You okay with that? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think, I think um, you got everything, you got everything that I wanted you to know. And um, so let's just, let's go, let's go through the summary real quick, just to make sure we didn't miss something that you need to know. Common rail fuel injectors is the latest high pressure injection system used in the majority of major, I'm sorry, in the majority of current diesel engines. The basic concept of CR injection is to supply fuel at injection pressure to a fuel nozzle that electronically controls the injection event. Okay, that's different than a regular unit injector that made the injection pressure itself for the event. This system supplies the pressure the injector controls the event. Diesel fuel injection systems that rely on only engine or only engine driven camshafts to pressurize fuel cannot meet legislative uh, emission targets. That's why they came up with this because old systems couldn't do it. Modern common rail fuel uh, systems refer to a classification of high pressure fuel injection systems in which fuel is pressurized independently of engine speed. Okay, that's important to understand. This means that regardless of engine rotational speed and load, fuel injection pressure is matched to optimal values required for most efficient combustion, lowest emissions, and superior fuel economy. Enormous technical and manufacturing accomplishments have enabled CR systems not only to meet rigid emissions requirements, but to combine to secure a place for diesel technology in the future. Yeah, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. It'll probably just get better. CR systems are capable of multiple ejection events during one combustion cycle. I think that's the, the system here said uh, nine, but I know that there are systems out there that do 10. The biggest advantage CR injection offers is injection rate shaping capabilities, making substantial reductions in exhaust emissions Fuel consumption without hurting performance uh, requires changing the shape of the injection discharge curve during the injection event. In other words, we we, you, we saw on those charts how you know whether they're whether they're triangles, round, square, all those different things affect how that cylinder fires, and it ultimately affects fuel economy, emissions, and power. Uh, using separate Modular components in a CR system means that the fuel system can be easily adapted to different types of engines. The fuel system generally referred to today as a CR injection is more precisely termed high pressure accumulator rail or high pressure common rail. 
uh, combined with operational features of the unique CR fuel injector, the most flexible rate shape of injection events as possible with those systems. Um, yeah, they, some of the early systems, and there may be even some out there still today that use high pressure, you know, they're using a high pressure common rail, but they don't necessarily need to use the um, piezoelectric injectors. They have some that are just, you know, they just use a solenoid to do it. However, the piezoelectric is much quicker and it allows us to have m many more events during and more controlled rate events. High pressure fuel pumps developed a pressure required for injection under all engine operating conditions, including for quick starting the engine, the volume control valve uh, and pressure control valves use a pulse width modulated electrical signal to regulate fuel pressure in the fuel rail. The high pressure pump is driven at one half engine speed. I don't think I talked about that. It's driven at camshaft speed. So it's one half of engine speed and coupled to the engine through a gear drive mechanism uh, to minimize parasitic loss. Uh, fewer or newer pumps uh, have inlet metering capabilities to reduce fuel heating, improve fuel economy. That's using the fuel volume control valves, as well as uh, that says that they're all gear driven. The 3.2 is chain driven, but it doesn't matter. They're still driven off the uh, timing mechanism. The fuel rail is a thick walled reservoir of highly pressurized fuel used to supply fuel to the injectors. It is continuously filled with pressurized fuel supplied by the high pressure fuel pump. Not only can the fuel rail store pressurized fuel, but it also provides some dampening action for the pulsations of the pump. Um, let me just say that I, I made a statement that said that if an injector were to stay open, it would that it could inject fuel independently of the injector itself. In other words, the injector could, if the injector stayed open, the fuel pressure would be available there to run the injector or to spray into the cylinder. That is true to the extent that the, that the injector does not produce the fuel pressure. The fuel pressure is produced by the pump in the common rail. However, one of the things we talked about is the fact that the that the pistons inside the high pressure pump are smaller than this pin. Okay, this pin's a little bit bigger than a pencil, and they're about the size of a pencil. So they don't put out very much volume. They put out a lot of pressure, but not very much volume. And what happens? Uh, I've seen it actually a couple of times. Is um, is that you will have uh, on this, the injector nozzle tip, let me, let me get a picture of an injector in here again. On the injector nozzle tip in here. So this nozzle tip goes down into the, into the cylinder, okay? I've seen more than once, for whatever reason, this metal on the side here erode and it leaks, it causes this high pressure fuel to leak out in here, okay? Now I've had them leak and they just kind of run a little bit bad, but I've had them leak bad enough where if this, cause remember this is all, this is directly connected to the common rail, okay? All this is directly connected to the common rail. So if this thing has a leak and just running fuel out of it, it creates enough leak path in here that that engine won't run. It can't make enough pressure. It can't make enough volume to overcome the leak. If you crack a, like one of the injector lines, if you left an injector line loose and tried to start the car, it will not start because it, it can't overcome that leak. So I didn't mean to mislead you into think that the system had an, this gigantic volume of fuel that would, that would allow that to happen. Um, it, the system's not that large and, it, and it'll, it'll, a leak in the system causes a no start. And uh, I think, uh, do you, you know, do you know Joaquin? You don't know Joaquin. Do you know? Um, one of our guys, one of the guys is working for me. 
he he actually put a six four the injectors on a six four are under the valve cover on a six seven they're on the outside but on a six four they're under the valve cover and he left he built he built an engine for me put it all together got done and it wouldn't run because he had one line wasn't tight and it would it couldn't it couldn't if the engine would probably ran it was running and got a leak it probably could overcome that but had an, but trying to crank and guilt, build enough pressure didn't have the ability to, to overcome it and all i had to do is take the valve cover off we finally figured out where we were able to determine which side of the engine it was on all i had to do was just tighten the line and it started right up so um it's a uh, um This whole thing of, of the of the thick walled reservoir and all of that, it's very, very sensitive to fuel leaks. If you have a leak in the system, it usually won't run. Um, that's it. A fuel oil pressure sensor is mounted on the high pressure fuel rail and provides data to the PCM for closed loop operation. I think I've yapped at you long enough to know everything you need to know and understand about a common rail system. What you know there is what, what I've explained to you is more than I knew for um, probably 10 years of working on these things. I mean, Ford's, the Ford web-based training was good, but it doesn't explain, it does not explain how that injector works. It doesn't explain all of that stuff, okay? And um, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess at the end of the day, you don't necessarily need to know how it works. But if you understand how something works, it's a lot to figure out. It's a lot easier to figure out why it doesn't work. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, um, you can. I will post this. 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 Uh, um, PowerPoint up and it has those um, animations, but I'll also put I'll also post those animations separately, so you don't have to dig through all that. If you want to reference them for anything, um, and uh, all the readings that are in there, I they're all going to just kind of explain all that a little bit more at nauseum. It's up to you if you want to read them. So, okay. So I don't have anything else for this tonight. Thursday, we're going to cover turbochargers. Um, have you ever been exposed to turbochargers? Uh, nope. They're a lot of fun. There's a lot of information. Uh, I, again, a lot of information that you probably don't need to know, but, but how they work is kind of cool. And so we'll get into turbochargers and, uh, and there's, cause there's, there's, Fixed geometry turbochargers. There's variable variable geometry turbochargers, and we use ser uh, series turbochargers. So, and then we use a single sequential injector or turbocharger. So we've got multiple types of, of uh, turbochargers and how they work. Um, some are simple. Some are like, oh, but there's some some animations that kind of help. The unfortunate part is I don't have a animation of the single sequential turbocharger and that's that's one that i have the hardest time wrapping my head around what it's doing um but we can we can look at it stupidly together if you want and uh so any questions you guys you got it all figured out yeah okay then um we will see you um thursday thank you thank you let me stop this